Hello friend, how are you? I'm doing okay, thanks for asking. I'm so glad to welcome you into the safe place. It's a place of inclusivity and safety for any conversation to be heard. The safe place began as a image in my head of a wooden cabin on the lake. My own place of mental safety. And I welcome you here to listen in to discussions on mental and physical health mental illness and mental and physical disability. You may hear stories that inspire. You may hear stories that make you cry, both in sadness and happiness. But always told from a place of truth. And we hold dear the principles of love, kindness and compassion. Now, with that all said, it's time to hunker down, get comfortable, so we're ready to welcome you into a safe place. Hello and welcome Dr. Joshua Smith to uh, to the safe place. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thank you very much for having me. It's really awesome. Yeah, it's, it's our uh, our privilege. And as always, I'm going to happen straight over to you uh, for you to give a bit of an introduction to yourself. Uh, well, you know, uh, so my name is Josh or Dr. Smith or whatever people want to call me any other day. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, the quick overview is right now I do a combination of more general work. I have a private practice where I do kind of individual work, couples, family therapy. Uh, and then I work in a pain setting. Uh, so I guess by title, I'm a pain psychologist. Um, but so three days a week, I'm in a pain setting working with with chronic pain conditions, anywhere from kind of post-operative or surgery to kind of more chronic or degenerative. Um, before that, I worked with a lot of of chronic or persistent mental illness. Um, yeah. So i've I, I've had a variety of different of different roles, but that's the that's the quick overview. Amazing, and I I, I, mean, I as you know, because um, I, I kind of post all sorts of random stuff on on Instagram. There's there's some some lovely tie-in um, with my own experiences that that I kind of talk about, um, and some of the work that you do. And my most relevant thing at the moment is pain. So just just start off by just talking us a little bit about from a pain psychologist perspective, kind of what is pain, and what does it mean in in that kind of setting. Oh, what is pain? Uh, we're going to need a, an entire podcast <laughs> theory just to cover what is pain. Um, uh, so in terms of, I'll start with the the pain psychology and what is pain psychology, because I, I think one of the things that's so interesting is, is anytime I get referrals, I think there's some part of people when they get sent to me that think, oh, wait, is this because my doctor or my provider is telling me that some part of this is in my head? Or yeah. they've kind of said, hey, there's nothing else I can do. And this must really be emotional or mental. And and half of my initial sales pitch is trying to explain like, oh, God, no. Like our providers are really saying, hey, we need to try and approach this from every direction that we can. Uh, because, it, of course, pain is emotional. Uh, and I think there's a big difference between saying that, that my pain uh, is caused by emotion or saying, well, being in pain causes emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of what I do, uh, there's kind of two sides to what I do. One side is much more physiological in nature. Uh, I teach people relaxation techniques, meditation, breathing exercises. The concept or idea there is that you know it's impossible not to have an emotional reaction to pain. And the autonomic nervous system, all of these functions that we have no conscious control over, like heart rate and blood pressure, uh, well, when the body is in pain, it has a natural response that we don't have control over. It it tenses up. It's it's basically the fight or flight response. Yeah. The body is is under threat or attack. And so if you're out for a walk and a dog is running towards you. It's the autonomic nervous system or this fight or flight or pain stress response that triggers this response and says, okay, well, shot of adrenaline, increase heart rate and blood pressure, mu- you know, get your muscles ready to defend yourself. But if somebody catches the dog and leashes it, 
there's a visual cue that tells the body, hey, the threat's gone. So bring everything back down, which is often referred to as a relaxation response. The problem with pain, or honestly, it's it's chronic pain or almost any chronic illness for that, that matter. Yeah. There's no visual threat. There's no, so the body never gets a signal that the threat is away. So mm. it stays in this state of tension. Uh, not massively. It's not that same like heart pounding adrenaline response. But if I have a back issue and I'm sitting in this chair all day, by the end of the day, my back's going to hurt. When you have this chronic threat of pain or like of acute or sharp pain, the body triggers this safety response. It tenses up and so much of pain is caused by inflammation or nerve-based pain or, and if you think about that, almost like something is pushing outward. Yeah. Well, if the rest of the body, the musculoskeletal system out of safety pulls in, it can exacerbate pain. It's not the cause of it. And that's why I think when people get sent to me, there's not a like, okay, wait, we're, I'm going to teach you meditation and that's going to end pain. <laughs> if that was the case, there would be 50 more pain psychologists in my, in my, uh, you know, pain center and fewer providers. But so what I teach people is these techniques that are almost like life hacks for the body, where if you can alter certain things, whether through meditation or breathing, and it takes a little while to find what works for you. I'm not a big proponent of like this one manual says, do this and it works for everybody. Yeah. But so partially I'm teaching people these techniques to see if they can, honestly, if, if they can reduce or trigger this relaxation response. So I teach these, we go over them. And some of what I do is biofeedback work. Um, not sure how familiar you are with it. It sounds a lot more technical than it is, but <laughs> if you're doing it always, <laughs> I know, right? Honestly, we love to name things. With something convoluted or confusing, yeah. Um, but um, you know, if you're doing a meditation or a breathing technique for stress, well, if you feel tense and you do the breathing exercise, and then at the end of it, you feel less tense. Well, you don't need me or a pain psychologist or anyone to tell you it's working. It's a lot harder to do a breathing exercise, and at the end of it, say, "Oh, I think I got my heart rate down six beats per minute." So some of what I do is I teach people these techniques and, you know, I actually hook them up to a series of monitors, nothing on it. Most of them go on the hands. I have one that goes on the earlobe yeah. and I will have people do whatever technique we're working on. And I get real time response about circulation, heart rate, capillary constriction, sweat production, respiration rate. And at the end of it, we can pull it up on the computer screen and look and see are we getting the physiological response we're looking for? Um, if we are, great. I, I think there's something that helps with buy-in when you can look at it and say, oh, uh, Josh asked me to do this ridiculous thing and maybe it makes me feel more relaxed, but is it really doing anything? Yeah. But when you can look at it on a computer screen and go, oh man, okay, like, well, I increased circulation. You know, uh, you know, my heart rate and breathing came down, my blood pressure, like when you can see it and- it makes a big difference. Um, and if it's not working, that's helpful because then I know, okay, this might be soothing, but we're not getting the medical benefit we're looking for. And all the literature and research says, if you can learn to expose your body to a relaxed state that it wouldn't normally be in, that over time, it can decrease the intensity or severity or duration of some pain. Less so for like acute treatment. It's not like if you have horrible migraines and you're in the middle of a migraine, you're not going to do a meditation and be yeah. like, great, I managed to just kick that. Um, it's more something that I ask people to do regularly or as consistently as possible. Um, so that that's one side. Um, uh, but I want to just keep going. It, you know? it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I live with pain and as far back as I remember, I've always had pain. Um, so I was born with a, a lower limb condition. Uh, it's fancy name, uh, bilateral telebezic equinovirus, which is also known as club feet. Um, and the description my dad usually gives is something along the lines of that I look like a seal. Yeah. So yeah. The very nice way to put it. <laughs> I know. He's got a way with words. Um, <laughs> 
and the poet. Yeah, and I, yeah, I had surgeries when I was like four months ish old, and multiple surgeries to try and correct it, and they kind of worked. Um, allowed me to walk. That was the primary kind of tick box. And then it, over the years, you know, I've been able to play some sport, but never been quite the same as others and mm. all these things and always had pain to a really high extent that I'm very good at hiding. And I'd like to touch yeah. on that a, a bit more um, in, in a minute. But it, it's that experience of having pain and being at that kind of heightened level um, is a, it's a really interesting concept because I feel like that. And I know when my pain levels are getting particularly high because my kind of other sides, uh, the kind of mental, uh, mental illness side, and particularly with anxiety, I become more anxious and I become mm. more disassociated in particular. So that I struggle with. And there's such a close link into the two. Oh, I mean, it, it's impossible for them not to be. Mm. I mean, you're you're talking about kind of your overall intellectual system, your emotion system, your physiological system, and they all communicate through the brain. Yeah. And so they're all interlinked. Um, and being in pain, uh, it's exhausting. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure if you know the the battery analogy, which I won't you know go over again, but I'm not sure if you heard that one with, with Jordan, but that I yeah. use that all the time. And, you know, the, well, for anybody listening that hasn't heard that, the very short version is just, if you imagine you have your own internal battery as a meter for your own physical and emotional resources, pain, I think of as being like one of the worst apps to have on your phone because you can't close it. Uh, it's always open and you can't predict to what degree it's going to drain your resources. Yeah. So it means you have to keep this massive store uh, every time because you don't know. You don't know if today's going to be a day where pain uses 30% of your battery or 80% of your battery, which means all of a sudden, you know, constantly you're trying to keep a certain amount of resources. That's why when unexpected things come up, it can be really emotional mm. because it threatens how you've budgeted your day. Because if by after breakfast or middle of the day, you've had three or four things that came up that you didn't expect. Even if your battery is at 50%, you don't know what else is coming. You don't know. And for all you know, if the afternoon is when pain starts to spike and you didn't get any of the things on your list done that you had planned that day, it's just this huge stressor. Um, and in terms of hiding pain, and this gets into some of the things you've posted recently, you know, you put up something recently that I have said so many times where you were talking about loneliness. Yeah. Um, and you said something to the effect of, of loneliness isn't just about being alone. I say this to people all the time because being in pain or really not just pain, I, any chronic illness, anxiety, depression, uh, you know, really anything chronic I think what happens is, aside from it being exhausting, I think people go to a lot of effort to not have the headline of every story or of every conversation be about their pain. Yeah. In part, because you don't always want to talk about it and it's exhausting. And I think what happens is, unfortunately, you put on your face, you try and fool people. And I think we all have the people that we want to fool where we're like, hey, I don't want to talk about it. And then we have the people we kind of hope see through it enough to know, don't talk to me about it, yeah. but you know that I'm not okay. And when we fool those people, it puts you really in this double bind where all of a sudden it's like, well, I can't be mad at them because I'm the one who fooled them. I could tell them, but I don't want to talk about it. And the result is this feeling of separation from the people around you where they think they know what's going on with you but they really don't. Mm. And when you are alone and you feel lonely, if you look around and there's nobody here, uh, you might not like the lonely feeling, but the brain, the mind, the psyche, whatever we want to call it, can handle it because you're lonely and alone. When you're surrounded by people and they think they know what's going on, but they really don't, 
it is a much different feeling of loneliness to feel lonely and be surrounded by people. Yeah. And I think that it's it's a component of chronic illness that we don't talk about. This loneliness piece where, you know, I, I'm very visual, I metaphors and analogies all the time. But yeah. I think for some people, it almost ends up feeling like you're in like a video game and every mm. you can tell that everybody's a character and they don't know. And you know that you're a character in the game and you know the role you're supposed to play, but you're the only one with that knowledge. And so you're playing a role, you're watching other people play these roles and it makes it hard to relate to peers. It makes it hard to engage socially because here you are kind of saying like, okay, I just, I feel like there's this buffer and it's why when people have chronic illness, I think there's a tendency, I shouldn't say it's why, it's one of the reasons why when people have chronic illness, they withdraw because yeah. being around other people is exhausting and upsetting. And if you've spent your whole morning, you know, if, you know, basically feeling like, like if, if somebody asked you, Hey, how you doing? If the real answer is, Oh, today's the worst day of my life. We don't say that. No. We filter it because once it's out there, you know, I mean, an hour later, if that person's looking at you and they're like, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. It was just a moment. And they're like, are you sure? Cause you said, it's like, okay. So we don't say those things, but if that's where you're at mentally and emotionally, and you're having a conversation with a friend who's saying, oh, well, you know, I just got this new car and because of all the distribution issues, I couldn't get the color I wanted. And it's hard to relate to that when your morning has been, I don't know that I can do this anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's like, so no, I don't care about, you know, even though it might be a legitimate gripe or complaint, it makes it hard, it makes it hard to be, to be, to feel like you can be genuine and be around people. And I think that triggers this strong loneliness, which feeds anxiety and depression and all of it. Definitely. And I, I like to think of it a bit like um, one of these old school record players where you've got the different dials doing different things. And sometimes I, I'll have a pain dial and it'll be turned up to like 11 <laughs> because, you know, it's a rock, rock rocking out system. And I'm in so much pain that it doesn't really matter what else is going on. And to be mm -hmm. honest, the whole system could blow out because that pain level is so high, that 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 noise, that that vibration is so big, so powerful that I just cannot function. Yep. And then you've got all these other dials. So you've then got things like the dial where it's my my mask that I put on. And I, I've kind of talked a little bit about this before, where I put essentially a little bit like um lots of females and and many males for that matter put makeup on to kind of physically change their appearance and it, it's a it's a way of putting yourself out there in a in a different view to your inner self and i do that without that i do that in that i have a mask that i put on and that i wear mm -hmm. but the problem is that when you've got that dial of pain all the way up that mask hasn't really got anywhere to go. So if I'm then trying to fake it, which is what that mask is all about, something's going to break. Something's, something's not, not going to work there. It won't work. And it's, it's, it's how do you then deal with that? And well, but there's, there's no easy one way to deal with it. I mean, exactly. because this is where if you've ever been at work or, or heard somebody say, Hey, I have to get out of here, or I'm going to say something that I yeah. shouldn't. It's in those moments that, right. If you, if you think of the battery analogy, those filters take battery. So if you're low battery, if it's done, I can't access those filters, which means if I'm at work and somebody says, Hey, when's that conference we're supposed to go to? Well, if I've had six conversations with that person, put it on their calendar, how did it, the inner monologue might be, you got to be kidding me, <laughs> yeah. you know, but you engage filters, which take battery and it doesn't come out yelling at them or say, it comes out, well, it's going to be this upcoming weekend. But if you recall, we had talked about it, we put it on, your, but that takes energy. So if you are low battery, that's where people will say, I don't think I have good control. 
over what I'm about to say or, and I need to get out of here. And so what you're describing with the dials, it's funny because I, I, I use a model very similarly where I will describe chronic pain as, as like this buzzing, that annoying noise you hear in the background. Yeah. And some people will say, well, sometimes if I'm busy or I'm doing something I really enjoy, I don't hear it. And I think of that like life sometimes is like a radio or a TV. And if the radio or TV can be louder than the buzzing noise, you just don't notice it. It's not that the pain isn't there. It's not that the depression isn't there or the, it's just that something else is going on that keeps you, you know, more distracted. But if that buzzing noise is slowly getting louder and louder, the question is when will it cross the threshold? Mm. So for some people, they will keep themselves occupied all day. And it isn't until they turn the volume down on the radio that they hear the buzzing has gotten really bad. So that's when people will say they're go, go, go all day. They get in bed, their head hits the pillow and they say they have a headache. And they're like, it came out of nowhere. No, it didn't. That buzzing noise, that headache had slowly been turning up. It just hadn't gotten louder than life. So once everything else slowed down and you turn the volume down, all of a sudden now you hear that buzzing noise that's been growing all day. But if the buzzing gets louder than the radio, louder than the TV, no, you can't hear anything. And it doesn't matter if you turn the volume up on the TV or the radio. If that buzzing noise is at this point like a blaring siren, it's just more noise. It's not like you can hear the show or pay attention or hear any of the detail. You, you've you hit your absolute max. And it just all starts to sound like terrible noise. And people will say, well, then all I, I have to get away from the TV. I have to get away from the radio. I can't be at work. I can't be around people because then at least all I'm dealing with is this horrible buzzing noise. Uh, it, it's not an easy thing to have to figure out where do you adjust your day. Yeah. And one of the really interesting things that I've come to realize through a lot of therapy <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully all good experiences. Well, do you know, my, my current therapist is incredible um, uh, and kind of very fortunate to, to have kind of found her. Um, she, very patient. <laughs> <laughs> Good trait. <laughs> yeah. um, but one of the things that I've kind of come to realize is that sometimes when you can't physically escape, you have to essentially mentally escape. And it, it's kind of part of the reason where this um, podcast kind of came from was the the safe place. Um, and actually the safe place for me is, a, is an active thought. It's, some, it's somewhere that I will go in a, generally in a meditative state. Um, and it's my kind of place where my mind goes to where it's calm and I'm, I'm okay, I'm safe. I, you know, it's my, my okay, good world. But then there's also this other place that my mind will go to, which I don't have control over. And that is this pretty wacky world. Um, and it, it, it tends to be almost like a library of things. And it's, it's interesting that, that recently it's been changing a little bit and kind of adapting as I've been going through the therapy and, and, and you can kind of almost see it working. But I just find the 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 concept of your mind escaping itself to be a really fascinating one. And I mean, I know that's a big chunk of that is from pain, and that pain is my my big trigger with it. But also it can be pretty much any traumatic experience for anybody to 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 have. And I don't think I mean no one that I have known has ever spoken about that type of stuff. Oh, because people don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. They, there are all of these realities and things that happen that we're almost raised to or socialized to not discuss. Yeah. And it's a real, it's a real bummer. I, it's one of the reasons anytime I do a new eval, the question about whether or not somebody has ever had thoughts of suicide or hurting themselves is this, is this taboo conversation. And what drives me nuts is my personal view, just my personal view is if you talk to almost anybody over the age of 18, 
and ask them if they've ever thought about it. If they say no, they're either so guarded or defended against it, they can't go there, or they're full of it. Because we're mortal. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody has had something happen in their life where they've thought to themselves, boy, it would be nice if I didn't have to deal with this. Yeah. And the only way not to deal with it would be to not be here. That is a natural, normal, healthy experience. But we've been told, no, it isn't. Don't talk about it. So when people ask that question, when people say, oh, have you ever had a suicide attempt? Have you ever hurt yourself? We've learned to answer the question they mean, which is not have you thought about it, but have you taken it past that to really planning out or thinking about, or would you act on it? So even though people say, have you ever had thoughts? What they really mean is, you know, have those thoughts ever moved out of the thought realm and into more planful or more, more conscientious thought? But that means we're asking one question. People are answering another because if they said, yeah, of course I've thought about it. Well, that goes in your chart. And now this can change. And now all of a sudden you come in with a complaint and people are like, well, maybe you should, you know, go see, you know, a, a psychiatrist or maybe it's a, and it's because we've learned don't talk about it, but it's just a, it's a part of life. It's a sad, it's a hard part of life, but we don't talk about these things. And I think it actually makes them grow. It kind of promotes it all in the wrong direction. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of what you're talking about before, for anybody who hasn't had the experience of, uh, of a real dissociation or the, the example I always use is, is the concept. You know, and I, I'm, I don't love to go through too much like kind of technical anything ever, but um, you know, have you have you ever heard of the the term uh, cognitive load theory? I've heard um, of it. Okay, so very simply, all it really means is that there's a maximum amount that your brain can handle. Yeah, and the example I always like to use is a surprise party. So, I, for one, I'll never fully understand why people think a surprise party is better <laughs> than a regular party. Uh, it, it just seems. It just seems mean. I, or I, I guess there is this slim chance that you can get it right where you have <laughs> invited the right people and it's just the right scenario. But the the likelihood of missing on that is so – I don't know why anybody takes that risk. But if anybody's ever had a surprise party, they'll talk about this notion where they'll say, oh, I remember my day. I remember walking into the – restaurant walking down and I you turn ar- around a corner and all of a sudden everybody yells that exceeds the maximum amount that your body and your mind can handle so there's this response but what ends up happening is people will say for the first 10 minutes I don't really remember I remember people saying surprise I remember seeing this one person I saw in the back this other cousin of mine and then I vaguely remember walking around the room vaguely. I, you know, but it wasn't until I sat down and, you know, and the waiter put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hey, can I get you something to drink that all of a sudden I I was back? Yeah. And then they can enjoy the rest of the time. And because it means that whatever that max threshold is in that moment, it went past the threshold and the brain can't handle it. So it essentially that doesn't turn off because you're still walking and talking but memory doesn't work. Uh, you know, you'll you'll have these interactions, and the next day somebody will be like, "Oh, it was so great to see you," and they're like, "Right," you know, or they'll be like, "Oh, you were so funny," and it's like I don't remember that first ten minutes. Yeah. So, with whether it's emotional pain or physical pain or both or stress or there's if you exceed th- this capacity, it won't work. It, if you're maxed out, right, like this is almost like if you've ever seen any of those videos online where somebody is is going to like swing over a canyon or bungee jump and they're like dangling over the edge and somebody else has control. Yeah. Try asking that person what their birthday is or their social security number or an ID number. No, no way. They're so far past their max. You could tell them, hey, remember this one word. Never going to happen. They likely won't even hear you. They could even respond to you and repeat it. Doesn't matter because they're way past that threshold. I, it's a really, it's a, it's just a concept that it's almost something that we're scared of because 
as soon as you start to talk about another world or another part of me or even voices. So when I get into a dissociated state, what I'm saying and and who I'm being, I've got no idea, Mm -hmm. but I will have an extremely clear um, uh, recall of this other place and, and, and kind of voices and, and conversation that's going on. that has got nothing to do with the real world. And it, it took me about three months of um, therapy to even admit to myself, let alone actually talk about it to somebody else. Although she's my therapist and it's a, it's a, it's a different relationship than, than, than your normal one, but it's really scary. It shouldn't be, Could, but it I is. I mean, it's so, of course it is. I mean, you're, you're sitting with another human being and, and telling them, Hey, I, I've had this experience and I know it isn't the norm. I, I, I know it might be healthy. It might be okay. But I also know even the therapist may have seen it, may have experienced it you know, like from a clinical standpoint, but if they haven't been through it, there's this concern that people will be like, oh, okay, well we can. And it's really hard when you feel vulnerable to just say, I'm going to put it, even with a therapist. I mean, a a lot of my colleagues or people, I, I, we joke about this, that like, sometimes it's not until the third session that you find out what really brought somebody in because it takes some time. You're still talking to, I mean, in some ways uh, it's better to be talking to a complete stranger, Um, you know, and in other ways you're still waiting to gauge what somebody else's response is Mm -hmm. and those internal voices. And and I don't mean kind of clinical voices. I mean, our own internal narrative. uh, It's just such a hard thing when that internal narrative says, I don't know how bad this is. And yeah. I think it's really bad. And once I say it out loud, I'm going to get a response. And that response is going to help me figure out, you know, how far off or not I am. No matter what, that is a leap of faith. Big time. Uh, it, you know, years ago, um, <laughs> my brother and I went scuba diving. We, we didn't have certification or anything like that. So it makes yeah. sense. Um and even though I'm wearing an air tank and all these flotation devices and there are people around, when you step off the boat into the ocean, there is a leap of faith there where you're like, I know I'm okay. I know it's not that deep. I know, but you still have to step off yeah. and you don't know what the experience is going to be until you do it. It's nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it often takes people with therapy a long time. To get to a place, where I, I can't tell you how many people I know who have thought about it and thought about it. And it wasn't until things were really rough that they went, well, I have no choice but to take the leap because I can't hold this in anymore. And yeah. it doesn't mean it's not scary. And you know, it doesn't mean that therapists don't sometimes say the wrong thing or, you know, or have a response that's hard to read. And when you're on your absolute most sensitive, it, we take in all that data. Yeah. Uh, and it's nerve wracking. Um, but, and I think when those experiences that, that you're talking about, they, they can seem as real as anything else. And it's a really hard thing when you're basically like, okay, my intellect is telling me one thing. My emotion system is telling me another thing and they don't speak the same language. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, emotion and intellect just, I mean, I mean, if it did, that would be so much easier, right? If, if somebody has a fear of flying and they could say, oh, well, intellectually, let me walk through all the details. And everybody's heard that like, oh, it's safer than driving a car. Well, you're still in a giant <laughs> hunk of metal in the air. And if that feels nerve wracking to you, you can tell yourself the stats all you want. If all you had to do was like, think it over, like, okay, well then I would, I would never meet with anybody more than once. Yeah. They would say, Hey, I'm afraid of flying. And I'd be like, Oh, well, have you tried not being afraid of flying? And they go, oh, I hadn't tried that. Like, and we had the high five and they would, <laughs> oh, I guess no high fiving anymore, but like, you know, but like, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. And, you know, 
you can't just talk yourself out of it. And so when you've had kind of this internal process that feels so real, trying to get to a place where you could say, okay, how do I help? Like, uh, you're basically overturning your own internal fact check system and saying, well, I remember it. And I also know it didn't happen. And I want those two things to line up and they don't. Yeah. And that, that's a distressing experience. It, and, and it really is. And I, I mean, I had, so I've been on all sorts of medication recently, but opioids to kind of help manage the, the, the pain. And obviously the downside to op- opioids is that not, not for everybody, but for, for some people, your mind goes a bit freer and um, mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of be be just in place that you might not otherwise naturally um, automatically go to. Um, and I've always, I've always had it that the first day I take something, I'm okay. Second day, even if I haven't taken anything, I'm a bit out of it. Third day, I'm away with the fairies. <laughs> just, it's, just, it's just how it, it goes for me. And I had a, a period of dissociation um, a few weeks back, and I would swear that it was real because everything about it felt real apart from, as you say, the intellectual side. So there was there was magic going on, there was card games turning into real figures and, and actually being real and, and, and coming to life. There was games that I presumably have pay, played in my past being real and there was you know, just all sorts of you know, Harry Potter on steroids whilst also probably being on heroin type thing um that's just, that's a movie or book i think people <laughs> yeah <out>. yeah <laughs> um uh, but i and i said this to it to my my therapist i was like that i don't i can't get my head around that that's not real because everything about me apart from my intellect side is screaming that this actually happened and i was really scared <laughs> really really scared um but actually i didn't need to be and, and it, it was it was all okay but it just shows how powerful your 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 brain brain is and and can be when you're away from your normal self yeah it's i mean i'm, I mean, it sounds like a distressing experience so i'm sorry it i mean it doesn't change it but mm. you know I mean, it's, it's ironic, right? Cause you know, the, the title of your podcast, right? I mean, finding a safe place and si- finding a safe space when you know that you have some of these things, the, these kind of dual processes that don't line up, we will spend so much time trying to get them to line up and they might never. Yeah. And in those moments, when you're in that place, Being able to say, okay, well, the only thing I can do is make sure I am in a location and a space where I feel safe. And then sometimes it's being able to say, I don't know that I need to make sense of it. Mm. I don't know that I need to get these two. I'm safe. I'm okay. And, you know, trying to pull it apart and you're not going to get very far because the, the brain remembers it. I mean, almost everybody has some sort of memory that they don't truly know if it's a memory or a created memory. Kind of that story that you've heard from childhood over and over again to the point where you can tell it and you don't know. You've lost complete sight of, do I really remember it? Or have I just heard it so many times with so much description that I think I do, but in my memory, in my mind, I can see it. I can feel it. I, and I don't know. I don't know how much of that is memory or created memory. That is absolutely our own version of kind of chasing our tail because no amount of thought is going to help me get to a place where I can tease apart what part of that is what I really remember from when I was five and what part of that is because I have heard this story thousands of times 
And my brain heard the narrative and created imagery to go along with it. And it feels real. Yeah. And particularly that, because my, my memory is awful. In some way, in work, if you put me in a workspace, I can tell you all sorts of things about what's, what's kind of going on. Um, and to be honest, I, I'm probably in a dissociated state quite a lot at work, but for some reason, I end up being just a, a kind of dialed down version of myself to other people. So it's kind of okay. He says, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's okay from a functioning standpoint. I, yeah. you know, it's functional. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, with, with, with kind of all that kind of stuff going on and having a lot of that in the past, I don't remember most things. And my wife and I kind of talk about this quite a lot. Cause she's got really good, vivid memories of childhood and I've got two brothers, one older, one younger, and and they remember all sorts of things from from childhood. I remember maybe four things from the last thirty odd years, um, and they're not particularly great things. They're the kind of really, really kind of horrible things that stand out. But the other thing that that I've kind of come across recently. And it's from having my my foot in cast, <laughs> and I had I, I, again a, as real a recollection, a memory, or whatever you want to call it, um, of being in that same position before. But I never have been. The only other time that I'd had any surgery on my lower part of my my lower limbs was when I was under one years old. Mm-hmm. And something that I've started to kind of look into um, recently from my own understanding really is that r- relation of past, particularly traumatic events, pre-verbal, but from your childhood really overall, to how that can come back through when you're older. Um, it should be really interesting to hear some of your, your own experience with with that with that well i mean if we could solve the the to what extent and degree do the experiences throughout our life manifest in adulthood and how and track it well if that's something that we could give to the world that would be a real gift yeah. because there there are so many variables so many there's almost too many variables to try and figure out to what extent does one thing impact the other i'm i am a big believer in the world that we grow up in, the environment that we're in, the people that we interact with, it shapes so much. It shapes how we understand relationships. Uh, it shapes communication. I mean, the relationships you see growing up become the basis for how you understand kind of a successful or an unsuccessful relationship. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this recently, saying that if you grow up in a family that has a lot of kind of passive nonverbal communication, well, if when somebody says like, you know, oh, it's okay that you were late, but you know that it wasn't okay, yeah, but you don't talk about it. You know, it's this kind of that family system is a, I know you're mad. You know, I feel badly. We don't talk about it. Well, what ends up happening is that you start to learn. I don't actually know when somebody says something, are they saying exactly what they mean? Or is there an underlying other message? And sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. So people start to get really defensive because they don't know which it is. Can I take people honestly or not? So if that person later in life makes friends with somebody whose family is like, oh, we say everything that's on our mind all the time without question, whether you asked or not, that person can feel exhausting because now it's a, wait, we don't talk about those things. You, you don't say, I'm, I'm mad that you were late. And that feels like an assault. And all of these things impact who we are and who we become and that same cognitive load theory. Well, if as a kid you were dealing with medical, you were dealing with pain, you were dealing with with stress or anxiety or depression, of course your memory is going to be different because there are going to be lots of those times where you know you could only take in so much data 
Mm. And the sensitivity that you had was turned up, which means there was more data. So yeah. your siblings for one memory might have said, oh, well, th- my body wasn't giving me any data. So I-, I was able to focus or remember this or remember that, or, you know, for a natural empath or somebody who's more of um, kind of a caretaker or, uh, you know, kind of the, the go-between or intermediary in a family, they're constantly taking in, well, how did this person react to that person? How- so their memory, it's harder because it's almost like with a camera, you know, that you can get the, the nicer the camera, the more pixels, the more data it takes in. So you get a mm-hmm. richer, deeper photo, but then the file size is much bigger. So you can't store as much. So yeah. they might have all of these images that don't have nearly the data, which means their storage capacity is going to seem larger, but it's just that they haven't been bringing in quite as much. If I hope that makes sense. Otherwise I'm going to sound like rambling. You know. I know it, does, it, it does completely. I mean, it's because I, I have tended to be that kind of diplomat person um, as well. And what, even when I've kind of had lower levels of pain, I've still been having to th- think about what's going on. This person's mind, this person's size, what, what, what influence is this other person going to have? And this, you know, and it, all those, all those different interactions or data points, as you say, there is only a five gigabyte memory card, let's say. Yes. There's a and finite capacity. You, you either fill it up with one very quick thing. So in my case, it's probably the pain. Mm-hmm. And then everything else, well, unless you get, unless you suddenly get some storage elsewhere, which could be photos, could be could be other things, yeah, you know, other physical things you can draw back on. Well, how can you store it? Right, you just haven't got it there. Right. If if you use that model, and if your siblings, so let's say at that moment, and obviously we we can't actually you know come up with numbers for this, but if every single one of you had a five gig storage. Okay. Well, but if each snapshot they take is, you know, 150 megabytes and each snapshot you take, you know, is six, 700. Okay. Well then it's going to fill up more quickly. And if you have a pain and that is using three quarters of your card, well, then all of a sudden they could probably take 20, 30 pictures and store Mm -hmm. it. And you're going to be able to take five, if that, before it's full. And then it also might be that if you have to do other things, well, you might have to actually purge or clear your card out more often to make room, which means you can't just keep storing that. You've had to say, well, I need to dump a bunch of this. The brain has had to say, I can't hold on to this. I don't have room for all of it. Yeah. And so here you are. And it's like, yeah, you took those pictures. They were, but you had to dump them years ago. And likely you might've even had to dump it same day. And it's, yeah, it's, it's why, you know, even, even the people I know who have some mild, low level anxiety will describe things like not being able to remember parts of a vacation. And they'll say, that's so weird that you remember that. I don't remember that at all. Because that day, if it was something about the restaurant that was stressful, or if they were running late, or there was so much data they were taking in, there was no room Mm. for the memory storage. And so, you know, in some ways, the way that I picture this, as as odd as it may sound, I almost picture, I mean, and this is with dissociation and all these different things, you know, I picture in your mind that we have all these different characters, little versions of you running around your brain, wearing like a a sports Jersey that says what their role is. And there's intellect and you know, there's emotion and there's anxiety, there's guilt. All of these characters at any given time are trying to figure out how to maneuver life. There's also an unfiltered character and that character, you cannot stop that character from saying exactly what's on their mind. And unfortunately, when these characters get into battles, it creates this turmoil and duress. So 
if you think of it as like, yep, you have a character in your brain that's responsible for memory. Well, if the unfiltered or the emotional part of your brain and the intellectual part of your brain are, are arguing and brawling, well, then that character can't do their job. They're working mm -hmm. on breaking up the fight. So, I mean, in the example I use all the time with this is the unfiltered part of the brain is the one that if you decide today, hey, I'm going to give up sugar, not in everything, just pure sugar. I'm not going to eat jelly beans or, well, if you walk into work the next morning and there's a bowl of Hershey's Kisses out, it's the unfiltered part of the brain that goes, ooh, candy. Yeah. You can't stop that. But if the intellectual part of the brain goes, hey, you can't eat that. Well, all of a sudden, that unfiltered part of the brain is going to say, um, I'm an adult. I have arms. It's clearly for everybody. I most definitely can. And if the intellect can't pivot and say, well, of course you can, but we don't want to. If it says, no, you can't eat it. The unfiltered part of your brain will just say, okay, well, if you're going to be unreasonable, I'll show you. And all of a sudden you'll eat five, six Hershey's kisses. And then in the room walks guilt and says, what just happened? We don't even like Hershey's kisses. If we were going to waste the calories, why wouldn't we have eaten something else? And all the characters go, oh yeah, that would have made sense. You know, but the problem in my mind is that very often we don't have enough data. So some people will go to a doctor's appointment and the doctor will say, you know what? I want to get a little bit of extra blood work. This was not quite what I wanted. Okay. The unfiltered part of the brain is the one that goes, oh shit. Uh, and they call in creativity and say, hey, what do you think it could be? Now we all have people in our lives whose creativity character is uh, like an underachiever. And we'll walk over and go, well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Like, didn't they say you'll, they'll call you on Friday? So we'll find out Friday. And they're like, right, but what do you think it is? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> For most people, their creativity loves this. And so all of a sudden, you have the unfiltered part of the brain, creativity, um, anxiety, worry. They all link arms and they just start trying to come up with plans. So it's almost like they pull out a drafting table and they're writing like, what could it be? And they write it all. And, they, and then at the bottom, they're like, total disaster. And then they yeah. post that on the wall. And then they just keep going and they just keep coming up with scenarios of how horrible things could be. And before you know it, your whole room is filled with these papers and you don't even have to read the description. Everyone on the bottom says disaster, horror, end of everything, even though none of them are true. Mm. Try getting your work done when you're sitting in a, at a table and surrounded by all these pages that say doom is coming. Yeah. And one of those brain characters I think we all have like a disaster prep character mm. and some people, some people, their disaster prep character is more like an HR person and, you know, worry shows up and says, Hey, I'm really, I'm really worried about these three things. And their disaster prep says, sit down, don't worry. It's going to be fine. And they're like, no, it'll be fine if you go check them out. But when, when things happen in life, like a trauma or an injury or surgery, or when something happens that was totally unexpected, your disaster prep person goes, uh-oh, I miss that. My whole job is to be prepped for it. My whole job is to be ready for it. And I missed it. And then what happens is disaster prep and creativity start walking around all the time with like a hard hat and a clipboard, just looking yeah. for things that are wrong. And that, that starts to mess with memory and focus because if you're at work, and your work character sitting there and sending emails and in walks, you know, disaster prep and creativity. And they're just pointing at things and whispering and they got hard hats and a clipboard. And you're like looking around going, what, what, what is it? What is something? What? It? And then they just leave. There's no way that person's going to be productive. Yeah. And if in that moment they've been told dates or times, they're not going to remember it. Cause they're going to be like, yeah, will you stop talking to me about the fundraiser? What, what were they doing in here? You know, and it's why some people will describe feeling more calm when there's a real disaster or a real problem because that pulls disaster prep away from creativity because all of a sudden it's say, like, uh-oh, there was a flat tire. I got to take care of it. In that moment, disaster prep has to say, hey, I have a real thing that I, have. I can't just come around and make stuff up about what could be wrong. I need to go focus on this. And for that time frame for that time period, all of a sudden you almost feel less aware of, of all of these things. And, and 
guilt, by the way, guilt can ruin anything. You know, I, I mean, uh, doesn't it just, uh, it just guilt is one of those guilt and anxiety. You know, somebody could invite you to something and you could say, Hey, I really can't go. I'm just excited to stay home, relax, watch some TV, you know, and all of a sudden, if now anxiety comes in and says like, uh, do you think they're going to be hurt when they find out, you know, that, that you were just home and then guilt sits there and goes, maybe we should have gone. And now you're sitting on the couch and guilt and anxiety are just nonstop chatting. And, and you're like, I can't even watch or enjoy my show. They just love to re- come in and ruin everything. And when you've had a lot of trauma, when you've had a lot of injury or uh, you know any sort of form of trauma, quiet periods become the most stressful. Because yeah. when everything seems to be going well, their disaster prep is like, something's coming. Go find it. And sends out its little minions almost on like an Easter egg hunt. Find the problem. Something's wrong. You know, and that's where people will say, you know, things are finally good. And I don't know why I'm just, I'm more anxious because their brain is on the hunt. And yeah, I always describe it as if, as if my brain is constantly running at a hundred miles an hour mm-hmm. and there is just that there's no let up. So either it's, I'm focused on, on work and naturally part of my job is is risk associated so it is very much the disaster bit so actually in some in many ways that's a an escape for me because it's slightly calmer because but all those characters get to sit down and really exactly. work they get to really do what they're kind of trained to do and yeah. it's like oh thank god you gave me a task yeah and then outside of that unless i have something to do and it could be as simple as playing a game that just takes a part of my my mind away. All I have is the disaster prep, and it is mm-hmm. that it's that cycle of just rapid thoughts, just over and over and over again. And that, in its own, strip everything else out. So draining, so tiring, like emotionally and physically. Both. It's. I mean, and again, I, I know it's yet another analogy, but you know, sometimes I think when you have those things running in the back of your head, I think about it like a computer program. There's a program that's been told, review all of the data and come to a conclusion. What do we do? But the way the program is now written is if at the end of it, it it's inconclusive. I'm not sure what to do. Rerun the program. Mm. So it will just keep running. And then... If there's like a sub program that essentially says, well, and because if you have more than one inconclusive, now you need to come to the right or same decision three consecutive times. So even if you finally run that computer program and it says, I should take next week off. Well, we had 15 rounds of inconclusive. So now I need three. I should take next week off before I'll do it. So rerun the program. And if it comes back the second time with, no, I should work. Okay, great. It's just going to keep running. Yeah. And for some people, they have so many, 10, 12 of those programs running at any given time. And there are other people who it's amazing that their computer program basically says, run through it. If it comes back inconclusive, run it one more time. If it comes back inconclusive twice, pick and move on. Those are the people that we've all had in our life where it's like, come on. Like, (laughs) what do you mean you just picked? Yeah. Like you want to be like, I, okay, like I'm both envious and I hate you like, <laughs> it, because if you have those programs running nonstop all the time and multiple, it, it will drain your whole system. And I think sometimes the best thing you can do is, is when you catch yourself in one of those recurring programs is to adjust the code enough mm-hmm. to say, don't just rerun it. If it comes inconclusive, Pause the program until until a specific date. Because if you think through that whole thing and say, I really don't know. If I'm not getting any more data, well, then why not say, okay, let's pause this program until next Friday, and then we'll rerun it then. And if it comes back inconclusive, we're going to pause it again. And if there's a deadline, well, then at some point, that's where you just say, well, but then if I don't know, let me periodically run the program. But how do I give myself permission to say, I don't know? 
I don't know, and that's okay. So pause that program until later. And it, it it's so one of the things that that it's taken me a long time <laughs> to get to. <laughs> It, and and it's because of these constant cycles going on, and that, and it kind of links in with the, the kind of memory side of things and having the capacity to deal with things. So, I'm I'm 36, I'm 37 this year, and I'm only just now coming to terms with the fact that I have physical disabilities, mm-hmm. even though I lived with that my entire life. I have never been able to. Partly through fear, partly through sheer stubbornness, um, <laughs> and and just kind of how how I've been brought up, and that's not in a negative sense of the, how I've been brought up, but just it, it's just look, you 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 are able to, you can do. It's that kind of positive mentality, which is great. Um, but it's taken a really significant event for me to be able to reorganize all that and go, oh, okay, so yeah, I I do need crutches. I I I do need to use a wheelchair. I do need to ask for ad- adaptations at at work and and all these different things. But isn't it just crazy to to use probably the wrong word? that that's taken me 36 years, almost 37 years to come to. Oh, you know, I know exactly what you're saying. And on the one hand, yes. And on the other hand, I know people who haven't figured that out at 56 or 66. So you got to give yourself a little bit of credit Mm. for being able to get there. Because when you have any sort of chronic condition, uh, I think there's this the constant nonstop push and pull of, well, I don't want to adjust my life and make accommodations t- to adjust for the pain or for, for my illness, because it feels like then the illness is winning. Yeah. But if I don't make the adjustments, well, then the illness is going to get in the way and I just don't have as much choice over what it gets in the way of. Which means all of a sudden, I think this struggle that makes it so hard to get to that place to say, okay, I have a disability or okay, I have a chronic condition is because you don't want to feel like you've stopped working towards alleviating it. You don't want to feel like you've given up, Mm. but it's really hard to tell yourself, well, hold on. I can make accommodations right now that make my life better and make the pain or, you know, or whatever it is have a, a smaller footprint. And that doesn't mean I've given up on figuring out alternatives. The, the brain struggles with that because it's a, wait, am I fighting against this or have I given up? And, it, you know, it, and so we often default to this kind of F you to the pain to say like, well, nope, I'm not going to make the accommodations because I shouldn't need it. Yeah. And I see this all the time, especially in the last few years with the pandemic where people will say, oh, well, at work, I don't have a problem asking for a standing desk or a nicer chair because that's at work. But at home, no, no, no. How can I, how can I pay that much money for a nicer chair or for, you know, for the desk changes or for lighting? Or Because somehow it, it gets put in the category of a luxury at home, whereas at work, it's okay. And this last couple of years has helped a lot of people say, right, I have to make these same adjustments at home because it, it increases my capacity Mm. and it's a necessity. It's not a luxury, but it takes a long time to figure out a balance to say, Hey, I still want to work towards figuring this out. I still want to work on making it, you know, whatever percentage less impactful on my current life and physical ability or emotional ability. I want to decrease that and I'm working on it. But making these changes, making these accommodations doesn't mean that you're giving up. I actually think that's the biggest F you to the pain is to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to do what I need right now to make sure that it has as little footprint or little impact on my life as possible. And I'm still going to work on making it better, but I'm not giving in by using crutches, by using a wheelchair, 
I'm not giving in. Mm -hmm. I more look at that as so many people have had an experience before where they've said, well, I can walk. And it's like, okay, well, if you're going someplace that's amazing and that you love, why bother walking to the bus? Then from the bus to like, wait, reserve all of that energy, right? Reserve all of that in to, uh, you know, in to use when you get there, right? So you don't want to say, Hey, I've always wanted to go see this art exhibit. Well, I'm going to walk to the train and then I'm going to walk from the train to here. I'm not going to call for the service. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to pay for parking. I'm not. Well, but if now by the time you get to the museum, you're like, that's it. I used all of my resources because I said F you to the pain, but now I can't do it. Now I'm exhausted. I can't even enjoy the art. I can't even walk around and I don't want to be pushed around the art museum. It takes a long time to say, you know what? Do I want to have to be in a wheelchair? Do I have to want to use crutches? Do I have to, uh, do I want to ask for a ride someplace? No, I don't. But if I do those things, if I make those accommodations, when I get there, I'm going to have whatever resources I have to enjoy it as much as I can. Yeah. And that doesn't mean giving up, but it is a hard thing when you have that, uh, that balance of, uh, of which like the brain loves binary thinking. The brain loves to get caught up in the, am I doing A or B? Nope. I'm doing A while working on B. But the brain doesn't default to that. And I, I, I had a, a full-on light bulb moment, actually. And it, it's a reasonably recent one. And it probably is within the last two weeks at most. Um, and it was... <laughs> and it sounds silly kind of saying it, really. But these aids that I've been having to use on and off for, for a while, a while, about six months with the odd period before, what they're actually doing is they're allowing me to live my life. Whereas for the rest of my 36 years, I have looked at those as being, like you say, that I'm giving in or that I'm somehow giving up or that it's it's all over. And that's it. I'm disabled as if that's a bad thing when actually all you're doing with all of these things, and it applies in so many different scenarios is that you're just giving yourself the best chance. So <laughs> there's absolutely, I, I used to play golf. I don't play golf as much because obviously mobility and golf don't, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't go hand in hand. But when you're playing golf, you have an entire bag of clubs and you wouldn't tee off with a putter because it's the completely the wrong club. Right. It doesn't fit. It's not going to get you what you need and want. Exactly. Whereas you've got a, a driver and you know, sometimes you're a bit nervous about using that driver because it could go one way, could go the other way. But actually, you're giving yourself the best chance of getting as far down the, the, the fairway as possible. And it's the same principle when you're living it and experiencing the, the shift in dynamics from I was literally walking around because it's a, within my ankle, there has been a broken bone forever, basically. So I've literally been walking around on a broken foot forever. And I had it in my mind that, well, you just get on with it. But if somebody went out in the street and broke that same bone, they'd be straight into hospital, they'd be in a plaster cast, they'd be getting it fixed and and doing everything. And sometimes you just have to realise that, okay, it's not it's not the perfect situation. It's not that I am going to be a, a an athlete and you know that I am going to be the best at everything. But that also doesn't matter because all we really should be wanting and, and thriving for in life and striving for is to be having a good, enjoyable and happy life. And these things do that for me. So why wouldn't I? The next thing though is then 
getting other people to un- to understand <laughs> that that it's not a bad thing that I'm having to use these, and that is a topic that's very uh, interesting. Well, I mean, and we can, you know, I'll come on here as many times as you want me to, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I think that. Um, you're spot on in a lot. Of, I mean, well, for one, uh, just much more literally, I never use my driver because it will never go where I want it. <laughs> but, um, but I'm a horrible golfer. So that's, you know, uh, I shouldn't say that I have fun and I, yeah. and I'm good enough to not annoy good golfers. So, um, but, um, no, I think that using any sort of assistive devices or having aids who can help out or outsourcing in any way, you know, it's exactly that it's prioritizing. What do you want more of in your life? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, uh, you know, we all set these kind of anchor points or comparison points, and it's very hard to not set an anchor point or comparison to what I was able to do at whatever my prime was for that particular topic. And so the challenge is if you used to be able to on a Saturday, get up and pay some bills and clean the house and mow the lawn and then play with your kids or go do so. What happens is we compare to that and all of a sudden it feels like, well, should I really be having somebody else mow my lawn? Like yeah. I'm supposed to mow my lawn. And it's like, well, are you? Like, I mean, who, who said that? I mean, yeah. I, and I'm using that one actually quite literally after we had our second child, um, you know, in our first house that we lived in smaller house, fairly big lawn. It used to take me a couple hours to mow the lawn and we had a, an infant and a, and a baby. And let's just say there was some occasional friction about when I disappeared for two hours to mow the lawn. Yeah. And a good friend of mine, uh, basically what he said to me is he said, you know, there are very few problems in life that money alone can solve. And so he said, his approach is if he f- runs into something where money alone can solve the can solve it. The next question he asks is, can I afford it? And if the answer is, yeah, I can afford it. It won't put me in a bad setting and it will solve this problem that his approach is why wouldn't I do it? Cause there are so yeah. few problems that money can solve. And he said, if you looked into how much it costs to get your lawn mode and it was like that afternoon or the next day, my neighbor was having their lawn mode and I went out and I asked him and he said, well, if you don't mind being on the same schedule, it's $40. And I was like, oh, for $40, to not leave my wife with a, a toddler and a newborn and have the, and I was like, right. I want to be using my time and energy in a different zone. Mm-hmm. So outsourcing my lawn. Now, I think the difference mentally and emotionally is it was a choice. It wasn't either or. I think when something happens and all of a sudden it's a, yep. This isn't my choice. I can either mow the lawn and then I'm done for the day, or I can ask somebody to mow the lawn and then I at least have a few good hours or maybe more because mowing the lawn taxes you more in one way or the other. Yeah. I think there's so much stigma around disability or any sort of of support needed. And some of it's internal. Some of it is our own pressure, you know, that we have expectations of ourselves a lot of it is also external where people say, oh, well, you can't do that. Or how, co-? you know, and I think for one, you don't have to explain it to those people who don't get it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you keep it a secret, like it's some sort of shame point. I'm not, I'm just saying if there are people who kind of don't get like, hey, having somebody here a couple times a week or a few hours a day to take care of things means I can put my time and energy and effort into things that feel more meaningful or more fulfilling because my life was not less fulfilled by not mowing my lawn. You know, so I think that if there are people who get it, okay. If there are people who don't, you can explain it once, maybe twice, but at some point it's okay to just say like, yeah, I don't need their, I don't need their sign off. All that matters is that the people in your life, the people that, you know, that if they say, Hey, I I love that we're doing this because you're more present. It's trying to internalize that and say, right. That's not judgment. That's not, you know, it's just where I want to spend my time. And no, I don't like that. I have to choose one or the other. It's Mm -hmm. awful. If that's where I'm at right now, 
better to choose the things that feel more critical or more valuable or more fulfilling to you. It's not, and I wish there was an easier way to kind of get that message out of, of like, this is not weakness. This is not like, I actually think it's intense strength to be able to accept and ask for support. And half of these programs, that's what they're designed for. Mm -hmm. They're literally supposed to help when you need it. And we don't use them. We, because there's this shame or this, and it's, no, that's what they're there for. If there's a system in place that allows you to enjoy or be present for more of your life than you can be, not as much as you want to be, but more than, then we're, oh my God, I wish we could get rid of this stigma to be able to say like, no, if you need help and support and there's something there, utilize it. Better to use all those resources for, for the things in your life that, <laughs> that make you feel more positive. And you can't explain it to everybody. You know, I mean, that's in some ways, that's what I was saying before with the, like, when you put on that face, that mask. Yeah. Every once in a while, people trick you and they say, hey, how you doing? And you, and you do this internal calculation. Do they really want to know? You know, or are they looking for the out? Are they looking for the perfunctory, like, nah, I'm good. And when somebody tricks you and there are all these responses people give, I was about to say they're my favorites, but I'm being sarcastic. You know, when you finally, when you say like, well, here's what's been going on. Uh, it drives me nuts when people either will say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Have you seen a doctor? And you're like, you got to be kidding me. Like I've seen more doctors than you will ever see in a lifetime. I've had yeah. needles in places you can't imagine, but thanks. Or, or I love when people say, well, you should see my doctor. It's like, well, you've never had an issue before. Like, and so it makes you think your doctor is the best. Uh, or lately, my favorite is when people say, you know, oh, you know what? My neighbor had something similar and they went gluten-free and it <laughs> yeah. solved everything. <laughs> And I'm like, come on, you've got to be kidding me. Like, if this was a bread issue, like, if all I had to do was give up English muffins, like, okay, I think I would have done that instead of surgeries or, you know, injections or medic. And I think people say these things, sometimes people who love you and care about you and want you to be out of pain say the dumbest stuff and they don't realize that it's hurtful or. So, in those moments, it's know who your circle is, know who the people are that you need to have on board. And, you know, some of those others, it's giving yourself permission to say, yeah, you know what, I know what's best for me and my family or me and, you know, the people in my life. And, you know, how do I gain some comfort with that without needing other people to understand it or get it or be like, oh, well, how much longer will you need them? Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Like what people don't know is before you finally hired those aides to come and help, it probably took months and months and months, if not years, past when it could have been helpful. And that by the time you finally did it, it took a lot to overcome that. So when somebody says, oh, how long do you think you'll need them? They don't even know that it's like, are you kidding me? I I'm still feel guilty that I'm doing. Yeah. And so when somebody says that, it, it hits you. And Sometimes it's just really gaining some comfort and write it down, put it on, you know, like, no, this isn't just okay. This is a great thing and you should utilize it and you shouldn't give it away before you're like, utilize it as long as you can and as long as you need to get yourself back to whatever you need. And if that means having it in perpetuity, great. Then thankfully you have that so you can spend your time and energy in other areas. Or at least that's think, my view. But. And I think sometimes that it's it's all it's being willing, and I say that with some hesitation because it's easier said than done to to almost over prescribe yourself. So a, a, an example that that I've got. So I use different crutches. Uh, depending on what I'm doing. So I've got two two of my way, main ones, which are bright orange and deliberately very, this is me, so F off. <laughs> um, and then I've got my one that I use to get up the stairs because it's it's got a different grip and it, mm -hmm. it helps me get up the stairs. And then I've got a walking frame upstairs, uh, also known as a Zimmer frame um, over in the UK. And 
also I had um, uh, a um, not B day uh, the mobile toilets which I have completely escaped the the name but um, different bits of kit for different things that mm-hmm. post having an operation I it's might some people have call it a commode or a bed pan. commode that's the one yeah um, and then I had a different walking frame as well so uh, to kind of combat different different areas and you know things go over the toilet to help me get up off it and all these different 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 bits and I've now got the walking frame and my crutches and actually I, I didn't use half of that kit kit I didn't didn't need the the commodes because actually in this house we've got plenty of toilets and there's just no need for it mm. um and also I didn't need to stay downstairs which was one of the potentials because getting up the stairs was a bit of a question after what was a pretty pretty big surgery really but they were there and having them there gave me some peace of mind it wasn't yep. it wasn't the nicest thing in the world to have around around the house and to be honest it, if if at any point i've really really visually understood that we've all only got so long on on the, on this world it it was with all that kit around um but I would much rather have been over prepared than having the decades of me being completely under prepared and then having to literally take days out to recover from mm-hmm. things. Um, I mean, I remember going on just going on a walk around like the village. Um, one, I wouldn't get very far. So that was an issue because the pain was just too much. And for th- at least three days after, my foot ankle would be so badly swollen, so badly inflamed and in incredible amounts of pain, I couldn't get up out of bed. So why would I ever choose that over using some, some, some equipment? Hindsight, yeah, right. I mean, it's it's so much easier to look back and see, like, wow. In hindsight, that doesn't make any sense. Mm. Um, uh, Years ago, I was in, I was in a motorcycle accident because I'm an idiot. Um, (laughs) You know, a story for another time. And because it felt like it was my fault, I had this internal expectation of what I should or shouldn't do. So I was on crutches, and I was you know, kind of walking or crutching to the train. And then I was taking it down. And this is when I was in grad school. And it was probably only like maybe a three quarter of a mile walk from where I got off the train to school. There was a shuttle that would pick you up. I wouldn't take it. I was, I wasn't packing books and things in my bag. I was packing a change of clothes because by the time I got to class, I was sweat and I would change. It was so stubborn and so Now, looking back at it, I'm like, what a dumb thing I did. I, at the time, I just I couldn't get out of my own way. So honestly, things like this, this podcast, being willing to share with people, hey, this was my experience and it got hard and I wish I had done this before or even being able to openly talk about needing support, whether it's you know supportive walking devices or actual in-house support. That's the kind of thing that I think helps other people when they're in the middle of it go, oh, I'm not alone. And it's a huge gift to be able to tell people that and share with them your struggles. And so maybe these kind of conversations will help somebody else figure this out at 32 or 30 or 26. Maybe not. Maybe it maybe it will help somebody at 50 who still hasn't figured it out be like, you know what? Right. I need to do that now. And we've all had those moments where, where it's like, once you do it, yeah, it feels better to just know. I I talk to people about this all the time with medication intervention. Uh, You know, where in my mind, there's this, there's kind of two different thresholds, kind of one line and then another above it. And that first line I call the, Oh shit line. 
And when your pain or discomfort or stress or anxiety is tracking up, once it crosses that, oh, you know, or, you know, that kind of like, I guess more of an uh uh-oh line, so I don't have to keep swearing, you know, (laughs) but like, that's where all of a sudden, you know, it's tracking up, but sometimes you pass that uh uh-oh line and people just want to believe, nope, it's going to be fine. So if you use a headache as an example, I know it's going up and it passes uh uh-oh and they're like, I just, I want to hope that all on its own, it's going to turn down and go under the uh-oh line and disappear. But that next line, so if there's uh-oh and then there's oh shit, like, you know, like that in between zone, well, what happens is people just wait and they wait and they wait until it gets to the oh shit zone. And then they want to do an intervention that was appropriate for the uh-oh zone. Yeah. They want to say, okay, well, now that I've let this go into a full-blown migraine, I'm going to try and take some Advil. Nope. Advil probably would have worked before you hit uh-oh or maybe in the uh-oh zone, but nope, you you skipped right over it. And so they're almost like one level off for the intervention that they should be using. And so I say to people all the time, you know, kind of well, make a different mistake. You know, okay, like, you can feel your your headache tracking upwards. Well, if your anxiety or stress goes up, the sooner you take something or knowing you have it with you, don't just bring, you know, whatever your over-the-counter, you know, intervention is with you to work. Bring whatever that bigger medication is because having it is is going to, sometimes it will make it so you don't even have to use it. You know, that's the comfort knowing it's there. But when people say, nope, I won't need it. So I'm not even going to bring it with me. Well, great. Now you're out of the house and at work and you realize, uh, uh uh-oh, I I misestimate. And now I'm far away from home. I don't have it. Stress level goes up. That will spike pain. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you have a countdown timer. And the second you realize, oh, no, I don't have what I need, it's like a catalyst. It just speeds it up. And I think any, whether it's anxiety depression, all of these things, sometimes we're just waiting too long because there's some sort of like, like there's there's like almost like a pride or some sort of, well, if if I don't need the intervention, but like, what, why I'm not going to get, you know, a cavity filled without Novocaine. I, I don't win an award. It's not like when I leave, I get some sort of plaque, you know, but there's this belief of, well, can I do it without the help? And for me, I'm like, well, we can keep doing that. But I think it takes people a long time to get to a place where they could say, you know what, I can do it without the help. It just means that the vast majority of my time, energy and effort is going to go towards that one thing. And it's really when they hit a point where they say, yeah, I, I I would rather use the help, use the benefit, use the, and put my time elsewhere. It takes everybody a different amount of time to get there. Yeah. And I think conversations and allowing people to understand and kind of learn from your own mistakes. I, mean, I, I, I do this a lot in, in work where I'm, if I've got somebody that's new in and is wanting to do different things and is talking to me about them and <laughs> rather than going through all the great things that, that I might have done, what I instead do is say, okay, so these are the things that looking back if I had changed, if I had done uh, in a different way, not necessarily a better way, just in a different way, that actually that would have got me to this point much quicker. And I, and in work, I do that all the time. Yeah. But again, it's taken 30 odd years for me to even think about using any form of pain. And I mean, any form of painkiller um, or, or pain medication just out of sheer stubbornness, <laughs> sheer well, and, stubbornness. And well, I mean, we might have to save that for for a, a, a because you know pain medication and opioids, and I mean, we 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 could we could talk about that for you know um, you know it, it is it's interesting because there's so much stigma around it, mm-hmm. and you know both in the media and individually, and then in the medical field. Um, it's interesting because there are lots of medications and interventions that have real benefit in, in one particular area. And 
uh, you know, opioids specifically, like, you know, we know there's, they can be really excellent for short-term acute pain. They become more problematic in long-term use. But I think when, when it gets clumped into a global, like, nope, all bad. Yeah. Uh, then even when somebody's given them post-operatively or there's a, oh, should I use them? Should I not, you know, and yeah, we'll have to save that for another time, but you know, um, well, um, and, and I, I will definitely be having you back on because I think there's, <laughs> there's, there's so much that we could talk about. Um, and this conversation itself has been, has been just wonderful. Um, uh, it's been really enjoyable. I, 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 I can't thank you enough for, for inviting me on. And I hope, I hope these kind of conversations are of value and definitely. Yeah. Um, there's a few things that I do though, before I let anyone go. All right. So first question for you is, and this is a very purposeful age that, that I put in there, but if you had your five-year-old self and you were going to give your five-year-old self advice, what advice would you give? Oh my God. Um, I, a five-year-old version of myself. I think probably the biggest advice I, I would want to be able to impart five might be a little young, but it would be, there's so much of that early, those early years that we take so seriously and everything feels so big and so intense. And I wish there was a way to kind of get that across to be like, you know what, enjoy it. It's not as serious as you think it is. And, you know, there are so many things that are going to feel like the biggest deal or, and the quicker you can get to feeling comfortable with who you are and not trying to be somebody else or not try, the quicker you get to a place where you can really just enjoy life and not feeling like, yeah, it's okay if I'm different or I have a different approach and that's okay. And if some people don't like it, that's, that's okay. Also, it doesn't mean yeah. anything's wrong with them, but I, 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 I wish there was a way to kind of get that in earlier. So it didn't make some of those early school year so hard for so many kids mm. amazing i like that and the other question and there's a two-part question to this so first of all let's imagine for a moment that i am the world's best chef and we're going to have a dinner party so what would you be um, wanting me to cook uh for you and for the dinner party oh see it's interesting because you said it's a two-part question. And unfortunately, I almost have a two-part answer, which is um, <laughs> one, uh, if you were the world's best chef, uh, some part of me would be ecstatic to be like, cook me something I've never had. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but that's it, that feels like too much of a cop-out answer uh, of kind of saying like, oh no, I would want the chef to decide. Um, oh, if I really had to pick... I'm trying to think of what the various things that I've had before, um, like kind of category wise. Uh, oh, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this. I think I would, I've had some Mediterranean food that has some spices and diff, like that are just in a different, you know, and so I think I might go in that route, but yeah, I wouldn't okay. even know specifically what to ask. Um, but I think so I'll, I, leave, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I think a Mediter Mediterranean direction um, for a world class chef is probably uh, is probably enough. So that 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 is yours for that dinner party. And the second part of the question is: so we've got this amazing meal. We've got a table, and you're there. I'm there, and there's four other empty chairs. Who would you want there? Four other empty chairs. I mean, I, well, I, I uh, it's funny because I really, I would, I would want my wife and kids there. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I would have to think about the kids because it, first I have to get them to eat something other than hot dogs, macaroni and cheese <laughs> and chicken nuggets. Um, yeah. and, and with a world-class chef, I'd be somewhat terrified for them to be like, yeah, this doesn't look like the way I've had it at home. <laughs> um, you know, a problem that we created all of our own. Um, but yeah, so I think I would, I would go with my, with my family. I love that. And it, it, 
that I, I asked both those questions because I think it, it one, it's, it's a thing that we don't think about all that often. And the food thing in particular, I actually really like your first um, response in that it just shows that you're willing to try different things and experience different things and are open to that. Um, and then the, the kind of family connection there is 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 just so wholesome and and uh, and lovely. So it's, I I always find it uh, a nice um, a nice way to tail off uh, off a conversation. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Josh. Thank it's you. Been an amazing conversation. I always end um, with three words. Uh, well, four words technically, um, and kind of sending it away with uh, love and compassion and kindness. So, thank you very much, uh, and uh, yeah, please do do uh, enjoy the rest of your day. You too, and I look forward to being on again. Amazing. Well, thank you, friends. That's all we've got time for today. I'm sure you have enjoyed uh, today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you rate uh, the episode and the show's five stars on whatever platform you might be listening on. And of course, please share your own stories and your own um, kind of th- thoughts and feelings of the episodes in the reviews. You can also find me um, on I am Gavin Clark and that's Clark with an E over on Instagram and you can search for The Safe Place uh, on there too it's a safe place podcast but for now I'll send you away with love kindness and compassion speak soon